Hi there. In this episode, Hitler was less evil than you think. I'll be reading quotes from Jordan Peterson about Adolf Hitler and the National Socialists. Let's begin, shall we? One of the things I've always thought about Hitler is that, you know, people, you have to admire Hitler. That's the thing, because he was an organizational genius. You know, the thing that doesn't stop people from being Hitler, the thing people don't refuse the ambition to become Hitler because they don't have the genocidal motivation. They don't follow that pathway because they don't have the organizational genius. They've got the damned motivation. No one likes to think they're a Nazi, but everyone is one. Look, it was 95% participation in Germany, and the only thing that distinguishes, you know, the average person from Hitler is that Hitler was an organizational genius. That's the distinction. It's not the bloody motivation. It's the ability. The Germans were an organized, are an organized people, were an organized people. The Nazis had incredibly organized, orderly public displays. At Nuremberg rallies, troops were all organized into basically perfect squares. Hitler was a great admirer of willpower, which is also something that's associated with conscientiousness and orderliness. He was very proud of his ability to stand like this, Peterson gives the Nazi salute, for eight hours in the back of a car, and his ability to withstand trying circumstances by willpower alone. Well, if you're wondering about orderliness, I mean, take a look at that, man. So that's Nuremberg, right? That was the biggest rally grounds ever made in human history. Nuremberg. Hitler was unbelievably good at spectacle. Look how absolutely perfectly ordered that is. God only knows how many people are there. Several hundred thousand. All in absolutely perfect formation. Orderliness. Gone out of control. And why? Well, World War II. That was plenty chaotic. After World War I, Germany descended into utter chaos. And so what happens when you descend into chaos is there's a corresponding call for order, and that was answered by Hitler and the National Socialists. And Hitler was very good at listening to the German population, and what they were demanding in a period of chaos was order. And so that was exactly what he decided to provide. Spectacles of order. So there's some more examples of order, right? Look at that. Everything. Everything geometric. Everything regular. The border's completely well-defined. Everything here is squares. Everything is lined up perfectly. Everything is uniform, right? Look it. There's pathways between the rows of people. This is again at Nuremberg. Perfect order. I'm also working on my new book. It's tentatively titled Beyond Order, 12 More Rules for Life. You think about the Nazis and their goose-stepping. What's happening is that every single person in the military becomes an identical unit, right? They're all uniform, and they're all imitating the dictator in an absolutely perfect way. And so, the dictator wants to impose strict uniformity on the entire population. That's order. Order. I'd like to announce my new book, Beyond Order, 12 More Rules for Life, which I've been working on diligently for the past three years. Part of the reason that the Germans preferred Hitler to chaos was because they felt that the order that Hitler promised was preferable to the chaos. Hitler was unbelievably good at letting the crowd tell him what to say. You know, he was... He was a mirror for the crowd, and he was a good orator. You know, Hitler was a fire worshipper in some sense, because if you look at the Nuremberg gatherings of the Nazis, you know, they were spectacular, spectacular celebrations, unbelievably dramatic and impressive, and they frequently featured fire, and fire is a purifying agent. You don't want to burn everything that the person that you fear owns. You want to burn everything that the person who disgusts you owns. And so you'll see people who are pushing the nationalist agenda hard. And Hitler did this beautifully. Everything that was outside of the Aryan domain of purity wasn't to be feared. It was disgusting. It was contemptuous. And it should be destroyed and purified by fire. And that was his message. The Nazis were unbelievably great at using fire of purification as a symbolic message. How do you purify something? How about with fire? That's something to keep in mind as we move towards the more political expressions of this. And the thing about something that's disgusting is you don't isolate it exactly, you destroy it, right? It's the thing you do with rats and insects, for example, is destroy them, right? And you do that with poison, you do it with fire, you do it by cleaning things up. Fire will cleanse everything. Hitler was a very creative person, surprisingly enough, but he was also extremely orderly, and so a devotee of willpower, right? 
So he was very proud of his ability, for example, to stand in the back of a car going through the hordes of people that were worshipping him, and to stand like this. Peterson gives the Nazi salute again, for like eight hours at a time. He saw that as a single application of will, and he was also obsessed with hygiene, right? He bathed four times a day. So I've spent a lot of time studying Hitler because I'm interested in ideological possession. You know, and Hitler's a great example of that because, well, his ideology was so harsh, but it was so attractive to people. It was so unbelievably attractive. The National Socialists were hyper-national, both in Germany and in Italy, and it's attractive again. I think the reason that people like Hitler are attractive, from the charismatic perspective, and this also goes for gangster figures in American movies, is that people do tend to admire those individuals who are courageous and act on their darker impulses. Hitler appealed to the darkest fantasies of the crowd, and he was really good at it. Hitler started to reindustrialize the economy and was actually pretty damned good at that. Hitler was good at speaking. There's one story about Hitler. He won a medal for heroism. I've studied Hitler a lot, and there's a bunch of things you can't say about him. You can't say he was stupid. You can't say he was without artistic talent. You can't say that he was a poor organizer. You can't say that he wasn't charismatic. You can't say that he didn't do wonders for Germany's economy in the first part of his reign. That's partly why Hitler had the charisma. It's right. Certainly what happened to the Germans could be regarded as immensely chaotic. In a society that's collapsed into chaos, you're going to get an unconscious or conscious demand for the imposition of order. And one thing Hitler was good at was order. You look at that picture. That's tens of thousands of people, all organized into basically perfect squares. And you remember how the Nazis marched? They did the goose step, and they did it absolutely precisely. Hitler was certainly willing to subordinate the individual freedom of the Germans, the Aryans, let's say, to his overall vision, and he was certainly willing to sacrifice anyone or anything that deviated from inclusion within this pure, ordered body. So that's a photograph of the Nuremberg Nazi Party rally grounds from quite a distance. The light that you see that's horizontal across the bottom is the front of the stage. The lights shining upward are the Luftwaffe's anti-aircraft lights, all arrayed around the parade ground and shining straight up. So Hitler used the symbolism of light against darkness as an adjunct to his political maneuvering. You can see the absolute order that's portrayed in that massive sculpture of light. You can see the precise precision with which everyone is lined up, so they make perfectly geometrical patterns. And this is a small stadium compared to what the Nazis were planning. Albert Speer was planning to build a stadium that would have had 400,000 seats. So you see on the right, everyone perfectly aligned, Everyone perfectly uniform, and masses and masses and rows of people all ordered in precise perfection. Huge mass rallies and highly emotionally supercharged meetings. And then the use of light and fire. And so Hitler built the biggest parade grounds in human history to host the Nuremberg rallies. And he would get in front of them on this huge stage with Greek columns, very impressive looking, and have blocks of thousands of people organized perfectly, orderly. The Germans are good at order incredibly organized, orderly displays, complete, and then at night, with fire. If you look at how the Nazis arrayed themselves in their political displays, you know, at Nuremberg, for example, which was this massive display area, huge grounds where all the Nazis would gather in perfect squares, right? Absolutely perfect. Thousands of people lined up in absolute precision. And then when they goose-stepped and marched, it was, everyone was exactly the same. So orderliness gone mad. You know, and orderliness is actually one of the sine qua non of an industrialized society. And that's one of the things that makes that so terrifying, because it also means that part of what drove the Germans to their high levels of engineering excellence, for which they were absolutely renowned, not only in World War II, but certainly even now, was that orderliness. That, that unbelievable orderliness. I do actually believe that Hitler was not a particularly pathological individual. He had a decent First World War record. He won a medal for bravery. I read a good biography of Hitler that claimed that had he quit, or been killed, or died in the mid-30s, that the judgment of the German people, and perhaps even history overall, would have been that he had been a very effective leader. The question really becomes, when a whole country of people thinks that you're the answer to their problems, what sort of character would it take to tell yourself that all those people are wrong? Granted the opportunity, how many of us would not be Hitlers? And then there's Hitler's wise father. You see, 
In this photo, he's surrounded by people who are focused in on him as though he's of archetypal import. It's easy to envision myself taking someone who just got off a transport train and have them carry a 100-pound sack of wet salt from one side of the compound to the other. People don't like to picture themselves doing that because it's too frightening, but I know perfectly well that I could do that sort of thing, and maybe I could even enjoy it. Understanding my own capacity to act like a Nazi prison guard or Gulag Archipelago trustee or torturer of children in a dungeon, I grasped what it meant to take the sins of the world onto oneself. Each human being has an immense capacity for evil. The Nazis decided they would clean up the mental asylums. Right. Because, well, you know, do you really want those sort of defective people being parasites on everyone else? And should they really be allowed to reproduce? And maybe it'd be better to, you know, euthanize them, because they're useless and they're suffering anyways. And so that seemed to go pretty well. But the thing that's interesting about being a neo-Nazi is that, like, you're in it, theoretically, at least as far as you're concerned, because that's the best group to be a part of. So you're very moral and upright as a consequence of your identification as the member of the most optimal conceivable group. Hitler was one of the great supervillains of the 20th century, right? I mean, he was, he's up there with Stalin and Mao in the panoply of satanically possessed leaders. Hitler climbed up the ranks of the hierarchy in a remarkable manner. It's like the elevation of the person at the top of the dominance hierarchy to the status of some kind of quasi-deity. It certainly happened in Hitler's case. And then, the brutal murderousness that can emerge from that. Those are pictures from the concentration camps at the end of World War II. I can understand Nazis, and the reason for that is because I can see that as an aspect of myself. That concludes the quotes and brings us to the end of today's episode. My name is Troy Parfit, and I'm the author of The Devil and His Due, How Jordan Peterson Plagiarizes Adolf Hitler. Thanks for listening, and feel free to subscribe.